Hello everyone, welcome to part two of this lecture on corpus analysis for the course Psychology of Programming at the University of Leiden. I am Feline Hermans. Again, the goal of this course is to think about how to compare two different programming languages. And in the first part of this lecture on corpus analysis, we focused on deciding based on a corpus what the benefits of a certain programming language might be. We also looked at examples of corpus analysis, for example, the example of Donald Knuth, who analyzed 250,000 punch cards to gain an insight on how to improve the Fortran compiler. This, as I said in the previous lecture, also is a clear example of humanities-like research in which the artifacts that people create are being studied rather than nature itself or the behavior of people. In this lecture, I'm going to look at a more modern example of corpus analysis within the culture of computer science research. And this is a paper that, or actually I should say two papers that I have worked on myself together with one of my grad students a few years back. As I said also in a previous video, corpus analysis can be used for both deductive and inductive research. And in this video, we will see an example of both of these forms of research within corpus analysis within the computer science or the programming language domain. The focus of the corpus analysis that I'm going to describe is a concept called code smells. And I can imagine not everyone is familiar with code smells. So we'll do a little recap of that topic before we continue. The idea of a code smell, it's, it's a bit of a fun, funny term. I didn't come up with the term personally. It is a pre-existing term. The idea of a code smell is a piece of code that smells, that stinks, doesn't really fit well. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bug. It's just a piece of code that isn't written in a very elegant way. And code smells can occur in any form of programming language. It could be an OOP language or a functional language, but they are a little bit associated with object-oriented programming language because those were the programming languages for which they were first described. Concrete examples of code smells are long methods. For example, so imagine a method that is a hundred lines or maybe a thousand lines of code long. Maybe it's perfectly fine. Maybe there aren't any bugs in this method, but you can understand that a long method makes it really hard to understand what the method does. The longer it gets, the harder it might be to describe, to come up with a good name for the method. So it might be something like do something or execute or process. The bigger it gets, the harder it is to find the right abstraction. And also longer methods might acquire more parameters for which it can also be more confusing. Another example of a typical code smell is duplication, also called code cloning. If you have the same code in multiple places across your code base, then this is harder to understand and also harder to maintain. Because if you make a change to one of the copies, you have to go make that change everywhere in the repository. So duplication is often also seen as a code smell. And another code smell, there are many. I'm just giving a few examples that we will see later on in the corpus analysis. Another example is dead code. Code that is, is written, but isn't executed anywhere on the path, on the execution path of the code. So a method that isn't being called anymore, a function that isn't being called something, code that is underneath a return statement in Python is also never going to be executed. And again, that doesn't lead to bugs because the code is never executed. However, this does make it harder to understand for a programmer what is going on because what code is that? It isn't even necessarily easy to analyze that, especially in a dynamic language like Python, you might execute code based on the name of the method that on the fly at runtime is being generated. So what is and what isn't that code can be hard to decide. So then if you're reading code, if you're analyzing a big code base, you're like, will this ever be executed? Doesn't seem like it, but maybe in another code path, it might be executed. So that code is another example of a code smell, something that you, you'd rather not have in your code base. Now that we know about code smells, we can go on to the topic of this corpus analysis, the programming language scratch that we have seen already in previous lectures. For example, the lecture on cognitive dimensions. There are a few concepts in scratch that are important to understand to understand the corpus analysis that I'm gonna describe. Firstly, in Scratch, there is the concept of sprites. So in this animation or game that you see here, there are two fish 
One is a hungry fish and one is a little fish, as you can see in the bottom left corner. These concepts are sprites. So a scratch program is organized in different sprites. Often these are different game elements like fish or monsters or other animals that occur within the game. And every sprite has its own code. So the hungry fish in this example shows different behavior from the little fish. There are also things called scripts. So as we saw in the Cognitive Dimensions lecture, a sprite, one game element, can have different pieces of programming that control it. So here, different behavior is exhibited when the green flag is clicked versus when the event got me is being broadcasted. These different pieces of behavior are called scripts. Sometimes they're also called stacks because it's a stack of blocks. A third concept, well, you know this, of course, already, is the individual blocks. So every, what we would say in a textual language, line of code in Scratch is one block. So that's the, a, a block is the building block in a sense of a script. And every sprite has a number, zero or more scripts. The research that we set out to do was to analyze code smells in Scratch, because this all started with an observation. It was very much deductive research. I, I was teaching children in a community center in Scratch, and I saw that very often they were showing this typical code smell behavior, making very, very long scripts or copying and pasting their codes all over the place. And I knew this concept of code smells from research that I had previously done into spreadsheets. And then I thought, hmm, code smells. We know them from OOP languages, but they have also been applied to other programming languages. In my own thesis work, I had applied them to spreadsheets. So I was getting interested. Is this something that also occurs in Scratch? I, I saw it anecdotally within kids I was teaching. And this led to the theory that we thought, hmm, maybe code smells could be as common in Scratch as they are in textual, traditional OOP programming languages. And that very much traditionally led to a hypothesis where we said, well, maybe the percentages of smells will be similar. We know more or less what the percentages of these type of code smells are in typical code bases created by adult professionals. Maybe we'll see similar things in code that children often create within Scratch. We don't know for sure, of course, as I also said in the previous video with corpus analysis in the domain of computer science, we don't really know who created the code. It might very well be an adult, but typically we assume that Scratch users will be children. And we were interested to see, do we see a similar percentage of code smells in programs that children create? Because again, typical thing you might want to do with a corpus analysis, this might inform teaching. If we see that children of, at a young age are already picking up the bad habits of professional programmers, we might also start to teach them code smells at an early age. So we set out to do an experiment, which took the form of corpus analysis, where we analyzed scratch programs to understand the percentage of code smells. We analyzed 250,000 Scratch programs because Scratch itself is open source, but also the repository is a little bit like, like GitHub for children in Scratch where you can see programs from children. This is also Creative Commons. So we were allowed to web scrape Scratch programs from the website and then further to analyze them. You might wonder why, why did we take 250,000? This is more or less the same number as Donald Kluth. Knut had punch cards. It wasn't because of that. It was actually because we wanted to have a fair overview of programs. We didn't set out to analyze 250,000 programs. What we did is we analyzed everything that was uploaded within 24 hours. So just for one day, we said everything that's uploaded today for the full duration of the day, we will scrape because then that allowed us to have a good representation across the world. Because it might very well be that Dutch children show different behavior from Japanese children, from American children. We don't really know that. So we thought if we do around the clock, it sort of will also be around the world. And then in one dimension that we have control over, that is the time zone, we will have representation. Because other dimensions we couldn't control, like the age of the students or the gender of the students, ideally we want to say, well, we have a nice distribution of ages and genders over the code base, but this isn't something we could control. So the thing we could control, different time zones, 
aka different countries. This is something that we set out to control and that leads for led to 24 hours of data, which were 250,000 programs. Coincidentally, the same as Donald Knuth did. That's nice, I guess. Before we're gonna go into the code smells results, I want to talk in general about the corpus. This corpus, by the way, I will link to this on Blackboard as well. Maybe we can link to it underneath the video. Also, the corpus itself is also open access. So if you are interested to figure out, well, I don't know, your favorite scratch block, how many people use it on average, you can download our corpus. It's in JSON format, so you don't have to analyze the programs itself. We have a flattened format and we also have stored everything into a database. So this is our gift to people interested in also analyzing scratch programs is that this corpus is open access for everyone to also analyze. Some things that we found before we're going to go look at the code smells results is that most programs are really small, as might be expected. 75% of the programs had just up to five sprites, so five game elements, 12 scripts of those groups of blocks, and 76 blocks. So this is a relatively small program. However, oh, the, and the medium program was two sprites, five scripts and 29 blocks. So really quite small. Half of the programs is smaller than this. However, there were also really, really, really big programs. The top 5% of programs had between 20 and 500 sprites and between 500 and 34,000 blocks. So some top users create ginormous programs that are, I would say, almost incomprehensible in scope. Here's one example of someone that created an entire adventure game in Scratch. You can already see by the list of sprites, look at the size of that scroll bar. Look how many sprites there are and lots and lots of complexity also. It is definitely possible to do this in Scratch. We've seen this also. Children show this behavior in real life, but in general, this is, is not very common. If we look at different programming constructs that are being used. Conditionals are used in 40% of projects. This is something you would typically really associate with computational thinking, with programming concepts. So this could be both an if and an, uh, or an if else. 40% of the project showed at least one conditional. Loops were also pretty common. 77% of projects had loops and this was repeat loops like a while with a stop condition, but also a fixed amount of time. So a repeat 10 or a forever, which you could say is a while true that repeats all the time. Loops pretty common also. The different types of loops though varied in popularity. The while true loop was definitely most commonly used with 52% of the pro projects that used loops. Just 12% used a loop with a stop condition and 36% used a fixed amount of a, a, a four I in range, you could say loop. So there were differences, but loops in itself were pretty common. Events were also common. And you could say that events are the underlying construct of Scratch, that you could say Scratch is an event-based programming language. 30% of projects indeed used events. So this was both broadcasting or receiving events. And then in broadcasting, there's this small difference whether or not the program should stop before the broadcast or just continue running. Variables we found were also relatively common, maybe more common than you would think in projects for children. 32% of projects had variables. So this was setting a variable, using a variable or changing a variable. Procedures though were less common, maybe not so surprising because this is where we get to the realm of real abstract concepts. It's very much a, in terms of com cognitive dimension, an abstracting feature. Procedures were just used in 8% of the project. 8% defined their own procedures. And here it is interesting to know where we're almost getting to the code smells that 62% of procedures were just invoked once. And then you could say, well, does this really warrant a procedure or maybe even has this scratch user really understood that procedures are designed for reuse? And it's nice if people are cleaning up their code, just you know, grouping blocks together and then making their code more readable. But typical use of a procedure would be multiple calls to simplify your code in that way, which doesn't seem to be the way that scratch users use procedures. So at least there's, there's something interesting there. 
Even though projects are small and events and variables aren't used all that commonly, complexity again does really show. Here's another example of someone that has recreated Minecraft in Scratch, a version of Minecraft, with no less than 300 variables and 300 procedures. It, it is possible to use typical programming concepts and to redefine procedures and to use them all over the place. It's definitely possible, but again here, you, you must wonder, is this a 10 year old or is this a, a bored adult that maybe <laughs> tried, tried this as a challenge? Like, can this be done where they would also have the ability to program this in another programming language? They take concepts that they know from other programming language and it's they're trying to get this to work in Scratch. We don't know, of course, but at least these are questions that, that are interesting to think about because I would say it is, it is unlikely that a 10 year old built this, but we, we don't really know. So complexity can be there. There are projects in the data set like the Minecraft I just showed you that had 850 procedures, 6,000 conditionals, and we even saw recursive procedure calls within some of the projects. So it's definitely possible, but it isn't very common. Then let's look at code smells. As I said, three commonly known code smells, long method, duplication, and dead code, are quite common in OOP or in general textual programming languages, do they also occur in Scratch? That was a research question for which we were analyzing this corpus. Long method was definitely present. Here's an example, it's sort of hidden behind the video, but you can see how it continues underneath of a very long method. Based on a, a known threshold algorithm, we said that a method is long if it has at least 18 blocks. And using that threshold, we found that long method occurs in 30% of the project, which is very similar to the percentages you would see in textual languages. So this confirmed our hypothesis that children show similar programming behavior to professional adults. Duplication. So for duplication, we took the definition of structural duplication. There are way different, a number of different ways in which you can calculate duplication. So we would say those two scripts that you could say here, they exhibit duplication because they have the same pattern. You have show, repeat, switch, wait, switch. But as you can see here also, the, the values of the variables differ. So the one is a repeat three and the other is a repeat two. So they aren't exact copies, they are structural copies. But a good programmer, of course, here would see that this is an opportunity for abstraction. You could create a function in which you say, uh, you have a parameter that is number of rep repetition and wait time and which costume would you say when. There is an opportunity for abstraction here that isn't being used. So this was our definition of duplication, a structural clone, so to say. With this definition, we found that across sprites, 26% of projects showed duplication and within sprites, 10% of projects showed duplication. So some, sometimes there was duplication between sprites or so the one fish has code that is the same as the other fish. And in some cases, even within the sprite, there had been copy pasting going on. And it might be interesting to know that there is a way in Scratch to copy paste code from the one sprite to the other sprite. There is a, the concept of a backpack in which you can drop code from the one sprite and then you run to the other sprite and you grab it from your backpack. So this duplication likely, again, we don't know, but is likely caused by children copy pasting through the backpack from the one through the other sprite. Duplication again is quite common, a little bit less common than you would typically see in code bases by professional, but still quite common, more or less in the range where you would expect it from professional developer behavior. Then the final code smell that we looked at is called dead code. And dead code can have different forms in Scratch. What you see here, all of this are different forms of dead code. So you can have code, a script that lacks a head block. So this is the top left, that this code will never be started, only if you click on it, but it will not be started within the interface because it doesn't have a starting block. Then bottom left, you have a starting block, but there's no code associated with it. So in essence, this block is being executed when the space key is pressed, it would run, but because nothing is attached to it, 
we still consider that that code. Other examples of that code are on the right. In the top right, you see a function that's being defined, but it's never called anywhere. And then in the bottom right, you see an event, when I receive such and such event, but this is, event is never broadcasted. So here are the, the dead counterparts that are missing. So the first one misses a starting block. The second one, lower left, misses the rest of the block. Top right misses where is this function being called. And the bottom right misses the event that's gonna kickstart. So these are forms of dead code. Each of the code the forms of that code occurred in different forms or in different percentages, I should say. In the left column, both of these types occurred in 24% of the projects. Functions without being called, 1%. And broadcasts without a broadcast sent in 8%. Together, all of these, any of these dead codes, 28% of projects exhibited a form of dead code, which again is quite similar to what you would expect from textual languages. In total, we could say all of these smells, or at least these three smells together, we see that yes, programs created by children do have quite a similar percentage of code smells, and this can then influence teaching. We hope this influences teaching. It has influenced my teaching personally, because now I point out to children, hmm, if these things are very similar, maybe you want to start something. Are, are you cleaning up your blocks regularly enough by deleting stuff that isn't being executed anymore? So the result of this experiment was yes, indeed, these percentages are pretty similar. If you want to read the whole paper, I will link to this on Blackboard as well. The paper is called How Kids Code and How We Know by me and my colleague Fenia Ivaloglu, that's also working at Leox nowadays. We published this paper in 2016. As I said, corpus analysis can be used for deductive research, of which you've just seen an example, but it can also be used for inductive research, where you have data, and from this you want to form a theory that you currently don't have yet. For the, to illustrate that, I'm going to talk about the second paper that I also wrote together with one of my grad students, where we reused this scratch data set to study identifiers, so variables and procedures, names specifically. We had this big data set. We thought, hmm, there's more to this data set than just analyzing it for code smells. We could also see how children in scratch name variables. This might give us an idea of, again, might inform teaching. We, we didn't really know what we were interested in. We were just interested to see how do kids name variables. As you've seen in the previous part of this lecture, variables in Scratch can take on traditional forms. They might be called x. You set x to zero, and then if x is zero, then such and such. But there are some intricacies in Scratch variables that make them different from variable names in traditional programming languages. For example, spaces are allowed. You can have a variable name called number space of space apples. This is typically not allowed in textual programming languages, mainly because it's very hard to parse. This is a design choice that's not necessarily based on what is best for humans, but what is best for computers, because it, it takes some getting used to, but once you're getting used to, you could say number space of space apples, it's way better variable name than n apples or amount of apples with underscores. It clearly explains what it, what it means, and it looks like natural language, which you already used to read, so that's nice. Something else that Scratch allows is to have numbers that are variable names. You can have a variable called 12 that you can then set to the value 12. Again, textual programming languages will not allow this because it would just be a disaster to parse, and, and also, wh why would you ever want this? We will get to that later, why you might want this, but Scratch allows it. Another thing that Scratch allows you to do is to create procedures with labels in the middle. So what you see here is a procedure that someone has created, merge. The first variable is hello, the first actual parameter is hello, and then what's in the middle, the end, is part of, you could say, the procedure name, and then the second actual parameter is passed. 
Textual programming language. I actually there are. I forgot the name, but there is a programming textual programming language that does allow this. It is possible to allow this. I think parsing wise, it wouldn't even be all that hard. But it isn't something that's typically done. Typically, in textual programming languages, the variables are just split with commas, and there aren't labels in between. These are three features that Scratch allows specifically in order to make programming easier and more programming programs more readable for children. Because we don't know these features from traditional programming language, by definition, we would lack a hypothesis. We wouldn't really have a theory of how these things would occur in programming languages because they don't. You see, this is very much inductive research because we don't know what to expect. We just want to look at the data and from that maybe form a theory that we could then validate or that we just, we're just happy with the theory. Let's look at those three characteristics and how they occur, how often they occur on our data set. Spaces allowed within variable names. 56% Six, of projects, no, I should say 56% of variables have no spaces. So even though this is allowed, it isn't something that's very commonly used. 31% of variables have one space and 10% has two space. And then the rest of the variables have amounts of spaces that are higher. So three, four, five, six, it still occurs, but it doesn't occur very commonly. So even, the, do, even though this feature exists, as you can see, most variables still do not use spaces. Then let's look at numbers that are used as variables, how often does that occur? So as you can see, it's not very common. About 350 projects, a little bit less I think from this figure, use a numeric variable as a value. Oh, I should say, use a numeric value as variable. So you can say, see that it's not very common, but it's still interesting because as I said before, why would you want this? What is the reason to use a value as a variable? So let's look at some of the projects that do this to shed a light on why you would do this. Why? Why? Let's think back of the lecture on cognitive dimensions. There's one cognitive dimension called viscosity, and that is how resistant is a program to change? How hard is it to change something? Sometimes people come up with very creative solutions to make a programming language less viscose without changing the programming language. And this value as variable behavior is an example of trying to reduce the viscosity. Let's look at an example here. This is one of the programs we found that use a number as a variable. You see that they just set the variable to the value. So 105 is 105 and 75 is 75. Because now what you can do is you can take the variable or actually I should say the constant because it's not changing at all. You take it and you drag it in the holes, which is way quicker than, think of the scratch interface, taking the mouse, going to the little circle, clicking it exactly, typing 75, and then typing 105. If these are values that you use often, then dragging is gonna be way quicker, less viscose, than point pointing, clicking, and typing the same value. So here people with the variable use are, you could say, appending the Scratch user interface to have constants that are variable. So when we saw this, first we were like, who does this? But then if you see this, you're like, hmm, it, it actually does make sense. This is an interface issue where if you want to use the same variable a number of times or the, sa the same value a number of times, this allows for, uh, requires lots of typing, which is too much work. Here's another example, and I'll just give you a few seconds. You can pause the video if you need to think about it a little bit more to think of what is happening here. So this is a different use case from the constant, a different use case than we just saw. What do the variables represent here? If one is one and two is one and three is one, then broadcast X win. What could this be? 
So what is happening here? Maybe you figured it out. Maybe you looked it up or maybe you just continued watching the video. This is tic-tac-toe. The numbers here refer to a three by three matrix. So one, two, three is the top line. And if all of them are one, then X or cross, I should say, has one. And the same is true for if four, five, and six have one or seven, seven, eight, or nine. In this example, you could say, well, are these properly chosen variable names? Shouldn't this be A1 and B1 and C1? But that is, that is thinking like a textual programming language programmer, I think. I would say this does really make sense. And if the programming language allows for it, then the way you might think of the problem is indeed square one, square two, square three. Again, in terms of cognitive dimensions, you could say this hack, to call it such, has a good closeness of mapping. The language you think in is one, two, three, four, five, six. That is most likely the thing you would be thinking of if you're programming tic-tac-toe. We have been conditioned to think of things like A1 and B1 because of spreadsheets or chess or having modeled this in a textual programming language. But actually I would say this is a pretty intuitive way to do it. So initially we were very surprised by this behavior when we saw it. But then if you examine the programs, you see, hmm, there are use cases indeed in which a value as variable name really makes sense. And maybe it is a pity that textual programming languages don't allow this because of parsing, because sometimes it absolutely makes sense. Let's look at the third pattern. So here's the pattern again, where procedures can have labels within procedure calls. So the and between the two actual parameters is just to help the reader of the procedure understand what goes in, in a form that's slightly different from textual programming languages that might have the name of the variable in the whole. This is everything. So these are the most used textual labels in between parameters of procedures. So you see, again, it's not very common. A bit over 800 projects use labels. What is most common? To add. Then you see a Y with a colon after it and tone and speed and an X with a colon after it. This is probably modeled after scratch. I don't have a, I didn't put a picture of this in the slides, but Many blocks, built-in blocks in Scratch have the name of a parameter and then a colon. So this is behavior that children probably see within the interface and then copy. What I thought was most interesting here and very striking is that thing. Maybe, maybe you overlooked it looking at the graph, graph, but that is a closing bracket. So some people put a beginning bracket after the name of the function and then a closing bracket in between. So here we're only visualizing what is happening in between. So you miss the name of the procedure. So the name of the procedure would then have an opening bracket and then the other part would have a closing bracket. You're like, why? Why would people use a closing bracket in a language that isn't parsed? Brackets are for parsers, not for people. We really started to think, hmm, this, this must be transfer from other languages, right? You don't come up with grouping it by brackets. Again, let's, let's go back to the other slide. Brackets aren't needed. There are already holes in which the parameters perfectly fit. This must be transfer from other languages where people somehow have picked up functions need brackets. So now I'm in scratch. And even though it's not needed for the parser, Still, I'm going to put brackets there, which we thought was very interesting. Another example of transfer you see from other programming languages in Scratch is this result that we also looked in. This graph that I'm showing here is from a paper by Benjamini et al, ICPC 2017, where they looked at one letter of variable names and the distribution of those. And as you can see, not surprising probably for Java, this was also true for other programming languages, the letter I is the most common one letter variable. Why? Because it's used in loops. It is for I in range in Python or in, in Java it would be open brackets int I, etc. I is the iterator and it's used in loops. And then you see J is also adjacent because often that is then the inner loop. Now we looked at one letter variable names in Scratch and we saw the same pattern. It's a bit hard to see here because of the video, but that big peak there, that is the variable i. So in addition to x and y, which are the other two peaks, y 
uh, I, I should say, is still very, very common. And at first you think, yeah, okay, that makes sense because yeah, it's, it's for loops. But think of Scratch. Loops in Scratch, they don't have iterator. There's a forever loop that doesn't have an iterator, but also the repeat loop is just repeat and then the number and then the rest of the loop. So you, you don't need the I. This must again be transfer from other programming languages where people use an iterator in a loop, even though it isn't even necessary for simple loops. This must be, we think, transfer that comes through parents or educators because we assume, and again, we don't really know any of this because we don't know who creates the programs, but we think it's very likely that Scratch would be the first programming language that people use. It isn't like you've done JavaScript for 10 years and then you're going to become a professional Scratch programmer. We assume that transfer isn't done by programmers coming into the Scratch community, but is done through parents and educators that show, model, or even tell children that brackets should go in functions and that i is a proper variable name, even though it isn't even necessary for iterators. So again, this is research that didn't really set out to have a hypothesis. We just want to understand hmm, this feature that are very unique to Scratch, how are they used and could they influence teaching? Could they influence the design of the Scratch programming language or could they influence the design of other programming languages that aren't block-based programming languages? Again, the homework for this week is to study corpus analysis in the context of the mining software repositories community. This has been placed on Blackboard also. That was it for this week. Good luck with the homework. I hope everyone is healthy and happy and safe. And see you next week for a guest lecture on how to detect gender of people working in open source communities. And this will be a guest lecture by Alexander Serebrenink from the University of Eindhoven. Bye.